Hello, and welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's M&A update. I'd like to introduce Brian Burke, a partner in Dorsey's M&A group. Brian? Thank you, Rima. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to the M&A update, our semi-annual look at corporate and alternative entity law developments of interest to the M&A practitioner. As usual, we have a packed slate of important updates for you today, but before we dive in, I'd like to introduce our team here for this afternoon. Uh, I'm Brian Burke, partner in our M&A group here in Minneapolis. I'm joined virtually today by Amelia Mesa, a partner in our Delaware office, and John Van Horn, also a partner here in Minneapolis. All right, jumping right in and starting as we usually do with news from the first state, I'll send over to you, Amelia, as our correspondent on the ground. All right, thank you, Brian. So we have lots of big news this time um, with respect to our courts. First of all, um, our De Delaware Supreme Court Justice, Tamika Montgomery Reeves, was nominated by President Biden for a seat on the Third Circuit. So we're very excited for her. She was the first African-American to serve on Delaware Supreme Court, uh, where she served since 2019. Prior to that, she was a vice chancellor on our Delaware Court of Chancery. Um, unlike a lot of our judges, uh, uh, she actually started her career not in Delaware, but in New York as an associate at Weill Gottschall. She then came down to Delaware um, to work with Chancellor Chandler to open up Wilson Sonsini's um, Wilmington, Delaware office. She is very well liked and very well respected and we are so excited for her and wish her the best. In some very sad news, um, Justice Randy Holland actually passed away in March. Um, Justice Holland served as an, as an Associate Justice of our Delaware Supreme Court from 1986 to 2017. If that sounds like a long time, it is. He was the longest serving justice in the history of Delaware. He started at the age of 39 um, and authored more than 700 reported opinions. Prior to serving on the bench, um, he worked downstate and was a named partner in his own law firm and then moved up to Wilmington and became a partner at Morris Nichols, which is a large firm in town. Just to show you how impressive his career was, from 2000 to 2004, he served as the president of the American Inns of Court and for this, he received the A. Sherman Christensen Award um, at the United States Supreme Court. Um, when he stepped down from the bench, he went to work alongside his good friend, uh, Chancellor Chandler at Wilson Sonsini. And just on a personal note, um, because I did get the opportunity to work with Justice Holland, um, when I was drafting these slides, it reminded me of when he did step down from the bench about a week before he came to the firm to start working. Um, he did some research and my children actually received a package in the mail from him. It was a children's book that his wife had written um, along with a really sweet and personal note. Um, I tell you this story just as an example of what a great individual he was, um, not just a brilliant judge and attorney. So an amazing person. His motto was your life is your message um, and he clearly had an incredible message. Um, so moving back to um, the Court of Chancery, um, as mentioned at the last m and update, uh, Vice Chancellor Slights did retire in May. He ended his 12-year term six years early. Uh, before joining the court, he was a litigation partner at the Wilmington firm of Morris James. He had previously served a 12-year term um, on Delaware's Superior Court. Uh, he presided over a lot of notable cases on our chancery court, including uh, the recent shareholder litigation against Elon Musk. And I am pretty sure you're gonna hear his name come up again today, um, as well as in future M&A updates based on the way things are going. Um, I don't have any details on what Vice Chancellor Slice is gonna do in retirement, but he did express his desire to spend some more time with his family. So that gives us a new vice chancellor, and that is Nathan A. Cook. He was nominated by Delaware's Governor Carney at the beginning of June and was sworn in last Thursday as Delaware's 44th vice chancellor. Um, he's been a corporate litigator in Delaware for 16 years. He's uh, successfully litigated multiple shareholder cases against large corporations such as Dole Foods and Clear Channel. He started his career at Abrams and Laster, which changed its name after um, we have Vice Chancellor Laster. Um, he did spend some time at Grant and Eisenhofer and prior to being sworn in um, this week, he was a managing partner at Delaware's Office of Block and Leviton. He received his undergrad degree and law degree both from UVA and right after law school, he clerked for Vice Chancellor Noble on our Chancery Court. So 
We are excited to see him in action and read his opinions uh, moving forward. So one of the notable things about Delaware is that we amend our entity statutes every year um, to stay current. Uh, this year's uh, proposed amendments, it's my understanding that they are currently sitting on the desk of the governor and are expected to be signed this week and should go into effect August 1st. Um, so last year we did not have a ton of DGCL amendments and I think we have made up for that this year as John will tell you about. Yeah, that's right, Amelia, thank you. Uh, the most significant of the amendments relates to section 102B7 of the DGCL. Under section 102B7 as currently in effect, a corporation may elect to include provisions in its charter to eliminate or limit the monetary liability of its directors for certain breaches of the fiduciary duty of care owed to the corporation stockholders. The amendment will expand the optional exculpation provisions of 102B7 to allow corporations to provide a largely identical liability shield to its executive officers in addition to its directors. As with directors, the revised 102B7 will not permit a corporation to exculpate officers for breaches of the duty of loyalty, for bad faith acts or omissions or matters that involve intentional misconduct or a knowing violation of law, illegal stock redemptions, stock repurchases or dividends, or transactions where the officer derives an improper personal benefit. In addition, under the amendment, an officer cannot be exculpated in actions brought by the corporation against the officer, including any derivative actions brought by the corporation. One key consequence of this amendment will be to alter the settlement dynamics in M&A lit litigation brought in Delaware. Following the development of the Corwin Doctrine, we had seen a trend of cases in which a Corwin cleansing, that is in which the deferential business judgment rule is applied in the review of a transaction, following a fully informed, uncoerced approval by disinterested stockholders, coupled with a 102B7 exculpation, which would permit claims against directors based on alleged breaches of the duty of disclosure to be dismissed at the pleading stage, while those very same claims made against officers were allowed to proceed. The amendment should eliminate this asymmetry for corporations that elect to include officer exculpation provisions in their charters. A series of amendments to sections 152, 153, and 157 relate to the issuances of stock, stock options, and other rights to acquire stock. Historically, under Delaware law, only the board of directors or a board committee had the authority to authorize issuance of stock and stock options. In a series of amendments adopted in 2001, 2013, and 2015, the DGCL was amended to permit the board to delegate the power to issue its stock subject to broad parameters set by the board. As a result of these amendments, the DGCL currently applies differing statutory requirements to the issuance of stock on the one hand and the issuance of stock options and other rights to purchase stock on the other hand. The intent of this set of amendments is to better align the process for the issuance of stock options with the process for the issuance of stock itself. An amendment to section 219 of the DGCL will eliminate a requirement that the corporation make its stockholder list available during stockholder meetings. This requirement dates all the way back to 1899, so two centuries ago, but has little relevance in the modern era. In any modern day proxy contest, a stockholder list is typically obtained by the activist well in advance of the meeting in order for it to solic solicit proxies. Amendments to section 222 address matters related to giving notice of meetings by electronic means and addresses issues that are unique to virtual stockholders meetings. I think that at this point, many of us, if not all, have been part of a video conference that has crashed mid-meeting. Hopefully that's not this meeting. 
New Section 222B will provide corporations with three practical options for providing notice of when and how an adjourned virtual meeting, including a meeting that's adjourned because of a technology crash, will be reconvened. Delaware's appraisal rights statute is being amended in several respects. First, the amendments provide that beneficial owners may now make demands for appraisal in their own name rather than working through the record holder as is currently the case. <clears throat> Second, in another amendment to the DGCL, which will become effective on August 1, at least we think it will, the conversion of a Delaware corporation into another entity will no longer require unanimous stockholder consent. Rather, the approval threshold will be a majority of the voting power of shares entitled to vote on the matter. Accordingly, Section 262 is being amended to provide rights of appraisal to stockholders in the event of an entity conversion. Finally, in another blow to the financial print industry, Section 262 will no longer require that the full text of Section 262 be required in notices of appraisal rights that are provided to stockholders. Rather, the notice can include a link to a publicly available resource that can be used to access the statute. This will include the website maintained on behalf of the state of Delaware. Finally, as I'm sure you all know, a Delaware corporation by default has a perpetual existence unless it specifically elects in its certificate of incorporation to limit its existence to a specific date. After over 20 years of practicing corporate law, last fall I finally encountered a Delaware corporation with a limited duration. My first call was to you, Amelia, and you helped our client work through several issues related to the expiration of the corporation's existence. One of the things we learned in the course of this matter is that under current law, there is no express filing requirement triggered by the termination of the existence of a corporation, which is elected to have a limited duration. This presents challenges to the Secretary of State's office when it comes time to verify the status of a terminated corporation. Well, in what may or may not be a coincidence, that changes on Monday. A corporation of limited duration will now be required to file a certificate of dissolution to document in the Secretary of State's records the expiration of its corporate existence. With that, let's take a look at the amendments to Delaware's alternative entity statutes. All right, thank you, John. Um, so we have a good number of alternative entity amendments this time, but I would say that none of them are quite as interesting or exciting as the DGCL amendments. So I will try and cover them quickly here. Um, first, we have confirmed that if you certificate your interests in your LLC or your partnership, you can execute those certificates using electronic signatures like DocuSign. So that's really continuing on with some of the amendments that we've seen over the past few years where um, our entity statutes have been amended to be very permissive with respect to electronic signing. Um, we've also added some clarifying language uh, with respect to the timing of filed certificates. Um, so certain types of certificates, such as a merger certificate, um, conversion certificate, they can contain a later effective time or date. So what this does is it allows you to file your certificate, but not have the merger actually go into effect until a later time. The time just to be, has to be a time or date certain. So for example, you can't put in there, you know, this will, the merger will be effective upon the Cubs winning the World Series or something like that. It has to be a set time and date. Um, it's oftentimes used um, for January 1st, um, just because our Secretary of State is closed. So what the amendments do this year is they confirm that to the extent that you have any facts in your certificate, those facts need to be true, not when the certificate is filed, but upon that effective time. So that's helpful when you're doing something like a merger and you might not have the approval for the merger done quite yet when you file the certificate, it's okay now as long as it um, is done upon that effective time. We also have some updates with respect to the procedure for serving process. Um, these I don't think will um, come into play very much and they were really just removing some duplicative requirements, but I had to include it because I may or may not have helped with the drafting of that amendment. Um, every year we seem to also be amending our C 
theories provisions of our statutes um, as they're being used more and we're seeing um, issues come across. This year was no different. We have a bunch of amendments here. Uh, first, we've clarified that a registered or protected series does not need to execute the underlying operating agreement in order to be bound. So this falls in line with the fact that right now an LLC or a partnership does not need to execute its LLC or partnership agreement in order to be bound. And I typically recommend that uh, they don't for various reasons. So now we know that a series is bound whether or not it signs that underlying LLC agreement. We've also clarified that the definitions of LLC agreement and partnership agreement may consist of one or more agreements, instruments, or other writings, and may include or incorporate one or more schedule supplements or other writings um, that contain provisions as to the conduct of the business or affairs of the LLC or partnership. So what this does is when we form series, they're often formed um, by use of a series agreement or series supplement or series schedule. Um, and this confirms that those series documents are a part of the LLC agreement. Finally, we have clarified that when you have an LLC or partnership that has gone void or um, fallen out of good standing with Delaware, and that happens when your entity fails to um, pay its franchise taxes or loses its registered agent, when you bring the entity back into good standing by paying the taxes and filing a certificate of revival, that now automatically um, brings your series back into existence as well. Um, it also uh, provides that any acts or things done by your series during that time when um, the entity had lost its good standing, all those actions are now validated. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian to discuss some uh, recent Supreme Court decisions. Yeah, thank you, Amelia. So this, this past uh, six months, the Delaware Supreme Court took up a case you don't see every day dealing with preliminary agreements or agreements to agree. And the case arose from a dispute between Cox Communications, which is the third largest cable television provider in the country, and T-Mobile after T-Mobile had acquired Sprint. Now, Cox and Sprint had previously entered into a settlement agreement back in 2017 that dealt with a number of things, uh, including one provision, which is on this slide, uh, which stated that Cox agreed that before it started offering mobile services, it will enter into a definitive agreement with Sprint for Sprint to be the exclusive provider on terms to be mutually agreed upon between the parties. Now, a number of years passed after the settlement and in 2020, Cox decided to enter the mobile phone services market. And in doing so, it asked for quotes from Verizon and T-Mobile now that T-Mobile had acquired Sprint. The quote turned in by T-Mobile was way more expensive than Verizon, untenably so. And when pressed by Cox, T-Mobile just pointed this language in the settlement agreement and said, that's our price, you gotta work with us. Now, Cox did not read the settlement agreement that way, so they went ahead and inked a deal with Verizon, and the resulting dispute over whether Cox had to work with T-Mobile as the exclusive provider, based on this language in the settlement agreement, precipitated this litigation. At issue was what type of preliminary agreement the settlement language was. Often, courts will refer to the different types of preliminary agreements as follows. First, you have type one preliminary agreements that are said to contain all material terms of a deal, and they contemplate the parties will negotiate a definitive agreement to memorialize those terms. But because the type one preliminary agreement does contain the material terms of the deal, the parties are bound by that agreement irrespective of whether a later definitive agreement is put in place. You have type two preliminary agreements on the other hand, which contain some but not all material terms, and also contemplate the parties will enter into a definitive agreement to memorialize uh, those terms. Type two preliminary agreements, however, fall short of being enforceable agreements in and of themselves, but they do result in a binding obligation on the parties to negotiate in good faith within the parameters set by the terms that were previously agreed to. Last but not least, as you're all familiar with, I'm sure there are non-binding letters of intent, which may set forth the party's understanding of the material terms of a deal, but because the parties expressly state in that letter that the letter of intent is non-binding, letters of intent do not bind a party to to an agreement or to an obligation to negotiate an agreement. At trial, the Chancery Court found that the settlement agreement prohibited Cox from providing mobile phone services without a contract in place with T-Mobile. They arrived at this by looking at the language and determined that it plainly said before providing mobile phone services, Cox would enter into an exclusive provider arrangement with Sprint. And that didn't occur. On appeal, however, the Delaware Supreme Court issued a split 3-2 decision reversing the Chancery Court's decision. They determined that the clause in question, because it was qualified on the parties mutually agreeing on the terms of the arrangement, 
was more properly classified as a type two preliminary agreement. That is, the parties had an obligation to negotiate the terms in good faith, but it didn't prohibit Cox from partnering with others if those terms couldn't be agreed on. Notably, however, Chief Justice Valahura and Justice Montgomery Reeves dissented, finding that both the Chancery Court and the majority readings of the provision are reasonable. So in their view, it was ambiguous whether or not this was a type two agreement. The takeaway here is, if you're entering into land of agreeing to agree, be clear in your language so that there isn't a dispute later on. Moving on, we revisit an area, area that the Delaware uh, Supreme Court has transformed dramatically over the past five years, and that is the area of statutory appraisal. So beginning back in 2017 with the DFC and Dell decisions and further addressed by Iberian partners in 2019, then Chancellor Strine and the Delaware Supreme Court undertook a massive shift in how the Delaware courts approach statutory appraisal actions. Historically, the courts used dis discounted cash flow analysis to determine fair value for purposes of appraisal, which would result in jackpot valuations and created a cottage industry of appraisal arbitragers who would buy in and try to reap the windfall of a successful appraisal action. In this trio of cases, though, the Delaware Supreme Court cut that off and held that deal prices and pre-market deal value less synergies should normally be given great deference in determining fair value in an appraisal analysis. Unless there are clear process failures or market irregularities, discounted cash flow or other expert methodologies, which sometimes produce those jackpot windfall valuations in the past, they're the exceptions and not the rule. The effect of this has been dramatic as the number of appraisal actions has plummeted and the viability of appraisal arbitrage as a strategy has diminished. But one question, however, that has come up is what does the deal price struck at signing mean, given that the appraisal analysis as set forth in the statute is conducted as of the closing? And last year, we had our first case addressing that question when we saw that Vice Chancellor last year in the Regal Entertainment Appraisal Action took the deal price less synergies, but then increased the appraised value due to beneficial tax law changes that reduced the corporate tax rate prior to closing. Well, left unanswered in that case is the following question. What if there are changes in the intrinsic value of the business that occur prior to closing? Well, Vice Chancellor Laster had occasion to answer just that question in the BCIM Strategic Value Master Fund versus HFF case. Now, this case arose out of the acquisition of HFF by JLL for $24.63 in cash and a fixed number of shares of JLL common stock. The total value at signing was $49.16 per share. By the time closing occurred, though, two things had happened. First, buyer stock price declined, meaning that at closing, the deal consideration was only worth $45.87 per share. Second, the value of the target actually increased prior to closing. Following the DFC and Dell cases, Vice Chancellor last year found that deal price less synergies was an appropriate measure of signing value. But in this particular case, there were significant and durable changes to the target company, which increased its value prior to closing. And based on the analysis of experts, he determined that it was about a 5% increase to the deal value. The net result of those two factors is that the appraised value of $46.59 per share was greater than the closing consideration of $45.87 per share. So in this particular case, a win for the appraisers. Well, what does that mean for appraisal actions? Well, first it shows that while deal price less synergies is still the default starting point, significant and durational outperformance by a target may warrant an upward adjustment to the appraised value of closing. And that opens it up for expert analysis, which is imperfect. Second, it shows that mixed cash and stock deals where, as here, the number of buyer shares is fixed at signing, present an additional appraisal arbitrage opportunity if the value of the buyer shares decreased before closing. So appraisal arbitrage in the wake of DFC and Dell is definitely diminished, but as the BCIM case shows, it isn't quite dead. So with that, John, I'll turn it over to you for a topic that, despite its name, has nothing to do with preventing floods. Thanks, Brian. Uh, the next case clarifies the default rule in Delaware on the question of what is commonly referred to as sandbagging. Does the buyer have the right to recover for breaches of seller representations that it knew or had reason to know to be false? State law is notoriously varied on this question. Some jurisdictions have a default position that the buyer is entitled to the benefit of the risk allocation bargain 
reflected in the reps, regardless of its knowledge, these jurisdictions are thought of as pro-sandbagging. Other jurisdictions have a default, have as a default an anti-sandbagging rule that bars recovery for known breaches. Similarly, jurisdictions split on the degree to which the default rule can be varied by contract. Delaware has historically been viewed as a rock solid pro-sandbagging benefit of the bargain jurisdiction. A footnote in a 2018 Delaware Supreme Court opinion suggested that just maybe the question was a little bit more open than had previously been thought and triggered what I'd characterize as a fair amount of consternation in the Delaware corporate bar. Well, probably not the first time, uh, first case of a porta potty to the rescue, but Arwood v. Arwood is here to provide some relief to the MA practitioner anxious about the state of sandbagging in Delaware. A private equity firm called Broadtree Capital bought what is described as a portable dumpster and porta potty middleman for $16 million. In what maybe should have been a fatal red flag, Arwood claimed to have no financial records and no accounting system. In lieu of financial due diligence materials, Arwood provided Broadtree with what the court called extraordinary access to its customer order system, what business records it did have, and the personal finances of the owner. On this basis, in the course of a seven-month due diligence investigation, Broadtree was able to construct a set of financial statements for the target company. The seller then represented in the purchase agreement that the financial statements prepared by Broadtree were accurate. After closing, Broadtree discovered that prior to the closing of the acquisition, the business had engaged in a fraudulent scheme in which Arwood's customers were systematically overbilled. This resulted in a significant overstatement of revenue in the Broadtree prepared financial statements. Broadtree commenced litigation seeking approximately $11 million in damages alleging breaches of representations contained in the purchase agreement, including the representations as to the accuracy of the financial statements which had been prepared by Broadtree itself. Broadtree further alleged that Arwood had defrauded Broadtree in, con in concealing the overbilling scheme and that the fraud carve-outs in the purchase agreement should allow it to avoid the limitations on indemnification contained in the, in the contract, including the $3.9 million indemnification cap. Vice Chancellor Slights had held that while Broadtree had demonstrated that Arwood had breached representations contained in the contract, Broadtree had not been able to establish several elements of required to support a claim of fraud, including the elements of scienter and justifiable reliance. As a result, the indemnification cap was applied. The vice chancellor, seeing an opportunity to stem the flow of questions being asked about the meaning of the Eagle Force footnote, addressed the question of whether Broad Tree's extensive knowledge of the target and its billing practice should, it, should preclude it from bringing a post-closing claim for breaches of representations. Emphasizing Delaware's contractarian tradition, Vice Chancellor Slights held that a buyer is entitled to rely on representations for which it has contractually bargained, regardless of whether the buyer had pre-closing knowledge that the representations were false. In other words, Delaware is indeed a pro-sandbagging state, subject to a Delaware Supreme Court decision taking a different position. Taking things a step further, in dicta, the vice chancellor reimagined Delaware as an anti-sandbagging jurisdiction and concluded that even in this alternative universe, Broadtree would have been entitled to indemnification since it did not have actual knowledge that the seller's representations were false. This result, in the vice chancellor's view, would not be altered even where the buyer's reckless disregard was the cause of it having not having actual knowledge of a breach. So even in an imaginary anti-sandbagging Delaware, it's pretty pro-sandbagging. 
All right. If you've been feeling sandbagged yourself about the lack of an update on COVID-related MAE litigation, your day is about to get a little better. Here's Amelia with the latest. All right, thank you, John. So yes, unfortunately, since we are still dealing with COVID, we are still looking at its impact on our MAE claims and um, clauses. So historically, of course, it has been almost impossible for parties to escape performance of a contract um, through the use of a MAC or MAE. Um, to the extent that they try to, they have to show that the adverse change is significant, long-term, durational, and not foreseen. Um, we only really had the one case back in 2018, the ACORN case, uh, that relieved a buyer from performance. Um, but that case is, of course, viewed as an outlier with very extreme facts. So then COVID happens, and we start to take another look at these provisions. Um, it started with our AB Stable case, which both our Chancery Court and Supreme Court have now had a chance to look at. That case involved the sale of 15 luxury hotels. Um, obviously, hotels were hit very hard at the beginning of the pandemic due to the shutdowns. There, our buyer was allowed to walk away from the purchase, but not because of an MAE, but instead um, a, because of a failure to comply with an ordinary course covenant. Um, since then, the court has also looked at a cake decorating case, which we previously talked about. And this time around, we are looking at yoga studios, which Obviously, we're also hit very hard um, when we had the big shutdown at the beginning of the pandemic. So here we have Vice Chancellor Slights looking at the level four yoga case versus core power yoga. So here we had in May of 2019, uh, core power yoga, which is the nation's largest yoga chain, it exercised a call option that required one of its franchisees, level four yoga, to sell the core power all of its assets. And they signed up an asset purchase agreement. COVID then hits and Core Power directs all of its franchisees, which include level four, to close down temporarily. Core Power then said they wanted to delay the closing of the asset purchase, but level four said, nope, we are ready to go. Core Power refused to close, so level four brought this lawsuit. So the court here um, looks both at the ordinary course arguments and the MAE clause. Um, first, Core Power tries to argue that level four had failed to operate in the ordinary close ordinary course when it closed down the yoga studio. The court um, disagreed and sided with level four's argument that yes, it had temporarily closed down its studios, but it did so only upon the request of core power, which was in fact in line with its franchise agreement. And since level four had always followed the franchise agreement, um, its action of closing down was in fact in the ordinary course. Um, with respect to the MAE, the court here also disagrees with core power. Um, and finds that um, there has not been an MAE because the temporary closure um, was not durationally significant in nature. It noted that even core power itself found that the anticipated shutdown was only gonna be a short-term hiccup in earnings. So once again, we have a case where the court is looking very closely at the language of the actual contract. Here, the court focused very heavily on the fact that when the parties signed up the asset purchase agreement, neither one had provided for itself an ability to back out of it. So core power had not included any conditions or any express right to terminate the transaction. And the court found this to be a clear um, indication that the intention was to close even if there was a breach of the APA. So by refusing to close, the court found that core power had committed a material breach and the court here awards specific performance and orders core power to close on the purchase. So our takeaway here is it is still almost impossible to escape performance through the use of an MAE. If you want the right to terminate or walk away from a deal, you need to actually contractually provide for that. So with that, we will turn it over to Brian to talk about waivers. Yeah, thanks, Amelia. So we next turn to a case that's been bouncing around the Delaware courts for the past four years, which you've had occasion to talk about in prior m and updates, and that is the Manti holding saga. So the case arose out of the 2017 sale of a private equity-backed portfolio company named Authentics that was sold to an unaffiliated third-party entity. Prior to the sale, the majority owner and sponsor, Carlisle, and the minority stockholders of Authentics had entered into a stockholders agreement, which among other things included a typical drag along right where the minority stockholders agreed to consent to and raise no objections against the sale and to refrain from exercising appraisal rights. 
The sale ultimately went through, but it did so on terms such that the preferred stockholders, most notably Carlisle, recouped their full investment while the common stockholders received almost nothing. The minority stockholders brought suit, and in doing so, the court was faced with three interesting questions. First, can stockholders waive appraisal rights ex ante? Second, can stockholders waive fiduciary duties ex ante? And third, assuming that fiduciary duty claims survive, can stockholders bring fiduciary duty claims against the private equity controlling stockholder and its directors, even in a sale to an unaffiliated third party for cash? The first question, whether stockholders can waive their appraisal rights, was answered back in 2018, when Vice Chancellor Glasscock found that it is perfectly fine for stockholders to waive appraisal rights in a stockholders agreement. Such a waiver, he found, does not contravene the appraisal statutes or public policy. And on appeal last year, the Delaware Supreme Court affirmed. Writing for the court, Justice Montgomery Reeves upheld Vice Chancellor Glasscock's decision and found that granting stockholders the individual right to demand fair value does not prohibit them from bargaining away that individual right in exchange for valuable consideration. Not to be dissuaded, the plaintiffs here brought post-closing damages actions challenging alleged breaches of fiduciary duties by Carlisle and its directors before the sale. Which brings us to our second question, addressed just this past February, and that is, understand that stockholders can waive appraisal rights in stockholders' agreements. Can they waive fiduciary duties ex ante as well? In the LLC context, it's very clear you can modify or eliminate fiduciary duties in almost any way you'd like, but in order to do so, the waiver has to be plain and unambiguous. Here, the stockholder agreement just had typical drag-along language that the stockholders would, quote, consent to and raise no objections against the sale of the company. There is no express waiver of fiduciary duties, unlike the express waiver that was included for appraisal rights. Therefore, because there is no clear fiduciary duty waiver, Vice Chancellor Glasscock found that he did not need to address whether such a waiver would be permissible. They left open the chance that it was not. Which leads us to our first takeaway here. If you want to eliminate fiduciary duties, you're best served going outside the corporate form and using alternative entities such as an LLC, where the court acknowledged a clear and unequivocal waiver is clearly effective. So with fiduciary duty claims not waived, we arrive at our second question, our third question actually, just addressed this past month. And that is, can stockholders bring fiduciary duty claims against a private equity controller and its director appointees in an arm's length sale to an unaffiliated third party where all the stockholders are receiving cash? Stepping back into the facts a little bit here, Carlisle owned the majority of the company and appointed three out of five directors. So it was clearly a controlling stockholder. Additionally, through his ownership of preferred stock, Carlisle was entitled to the first $70 million of distribution on the sale of the company. In 2017, at Carlisle's request, the company began a sales process with financial advisors initially indicating that they expected an over $200 million valuation. However, due to severe customer concentration with key contracts up for renewal that very same year, bidders shied away with many saying they'd prefer to bid in a year once they'd seen how the renewals went. And with others offering a lower valuation along with a split in the proceeds between an upfront payment and a holdback contingent upon the customer renewals. The minority stockholder and plaintiff here pushed the company to consider waiting a year to sell. But one of Carlisle's directors emphasized the need to sell then and now, saying, quote, he was under pressure to sell Authentics because it was one of the last investments still open in the applicable fund, and it was time for Carlisle to monetize and close that fund so the money could be returned to investors. Ultimately, the company was sold to Blue Water for only $77.5 million up front and a $27.5 million, million contingent payment based on renewals of the key contracts. Of that upfront payment, Carlisle recouped its full investment while the common stockholders received almost nothing. On a motion to dismiss the fiduciary duty claims against Carlisle and its directors, Vice Chancellor Glasscock denied the motion to dismiss. While we have seen in the past that liquidity-driven conflict theories are difficult to plead, Carlisle's desire here to access its funds, coupled with the non-ratable benefit that they received as preferred stockholders, gave rise to a reasonable inference that Carlisle derived unique benefit from the timing of the sale, not shared with the common stockholders, thus rendering it conflicted. So in summary, this case is a good reminder to the private equity sponsors out there. If you're looking to modify fiduciary duties, you may be better off served with an LLC or an alternative entity. And if you are a controller of a corporation or entity with fiduciary duties, liquidity desires and your place as a preferred stockholder in the waterfall may render you conflicted for purposes of a motion to dismiss even in an all-cash sale to an unaffiliated third party. And now, Dorsey and Whitney Mystery Theater presents 
the mystery of the missing merger consideration. With apologies to Brian, who prepared these fabulous noir style slides, I just don't have it in me to present this whole next segment using my fake radio theater voice. But this next case is definitely worthy of a techno thriller sure to send chills down the spine of any junior M&A associate. As the parties were preparing for the closing of the acquisition of a company called Graduation Alliance by an affiliate of private equity giant KKR, hackers posing as two of GA's stockholders executed a scam which resulted in the cash merger consideration payable to two stockholders being instead paid to an offshore bank account controlled by the hackers. Among the steps taken pursuant to instructions provided by the hackers was first, a change in the wire instructions and the financial institution information, which had been provided in valid letters of transmittal previously submitted by the legit stockholders, followed by a last minute change in the name of the stockholders on the payment schedule that was submitted to the paying agent. This was done to match the name on the payment schedule to the name of the holder of the offshore account. This latter change was a particularly ill-advised workaround designed to avoid triggering a requirement that a medallion guarantee be provided. The two stockholders whose payments disappeared into thin air then sued the buyer, the surviving corporation, and the paying agent engaged by the buyer to distribute the merger consideration to the target's former stockholders. In considering the defendant's motion to dismiss, Vice Chancellor Glasscock dismissed the claims against the paying agent based on a lack of personal jurisdiction. The claims against the buyer and the surviving corporation, however, were allowed to proceed, and the court left open the question of whether the law firm, which was the party in direct communication with the hackers, is a necessary party to the action and should be joined as a defendant. This case is interesting to M&A professionals less for its holdings than as a cautionary tale. Cyber criminals have previously hacked into email servers and other electronic repositories of confidential information to steal information, which was later used for insider trading purposes. This hack appears to take the art to a new level and looks to have been executed by a party with a high level of sophistication around transaction closing and payment mechanics. I would imagine that the fraud also exploited, at least in part, a sort of fog of war that often accompanies the closing of complex transactions. I think we've all been there with a, a, you know, a high level of pressurized activity, last minute discoveries, last minute changes to documents, all while the transaction parties are exerting intense pressure to get the deal closed. Amelia, I now turn it over to you and dare you to top this tale of intrigue and treachery with a review of recent alternative entity case law. I, I thank you, John. I don't think um, there's ever been alternative entity case law that could top that. Um, we do have a couple of cases, though, worth a mention. Um, the first one, although it's not really new law, I think it's a good um, example of a classic entire fairness review. Um, this one is in Ray Cellular Telephone Partnership Litigation. This case involved a Delaware General Partnership, which we don't see that often. Um, it was formed to hold a license to provide cell phone service. Um, here we have a subsidiary of AT&T that's the majority owner and the manager of our general partnership. So it pretty much controls every aspect of the partnership. So if you remember back to when we all first got cell phones, um, things were done a little bit differently. We all had set areas and then there were roaming charges, things like that. And over time, um, that all changed. And because of those changes, it impacted the licenses here that this general partnership held. So AT&T wanted to make some changes and decided it would be helpful to them to get rid of their minority owners. So they froze them out. Minority owners not so happy about this and they sued for a breach of the duty of loyalty. So here, um, Vice Chancellor Laster 
first looks at the transaction as a whole and decides that based on AT&T's role in the transaction, it was an interested party. So therefore this transaction is gonna be subject to entire fairness review. So whenever um, a transaction is subject to entire fairness review, it puts the burden on the defendant here, AT&T, to show that the transaction was entirely fair to the minority partners. They do this by showing both fair price and fair dealing. Here, AT&T failed to meet this burden. It used no procedural protections for the minority partners. There were no negotiations with the minority holders. Um, no minority vote was held. And even though um, AT&T tried to show that they had used an outside valuation firm, um, the court wasn't buying it. They basically found that the valuation firm had a longstanding relationship with AT&T and was influenced by them. So AT&T fails to show fair process or fair price. And as a result, the court holds that AT&T breached its duty of loyalty by engaging in an unfair and self-interested transaction at the minority partner's expense. The court then awards our minority holders damages equal to the difference between the consideration they received and the court's determination of the fair value of the partnership. Um, so in our last identity case to talk about, um, we're gonna talk about why a purpose provision is so important. Here we have JER Hudson GP um, versus DLE investors. This deals with a tax subsidiary program um, that's kind of being attacked by a various like scheme that's going around the country, various courts have weighed in. This time we have Vice Chancellor Zern, who says that she's gonna take a look at this through the lens of fiduciary duties and the internal affairs of a Delaware limited partnership. So how this program works is that the federal government provides tax subsidiaries in order to promote the development and maintenance of affordable housing. Um, they do this by allocating tax credits um, that are taken up by housing projects. The projects are usually held by limited partnerships and we have investors that come in, they purchase limited partner interests where the GP manages the property and the tax credits. The investors, instead of taking a profit from the property, they instead claim the tax credits. Um, these projects are developed to last for contractually 10 years. And then after that period is up, there's a contractual rover uh, where the properties are transferred to a nonprofit at below market prices. And that's to keep the affordable housing going. So in our new scheme, we have investors coming in late in the 10-year period, and they're trying to extract more value out of the partnership. Um, their goal is to stop the property from being transferred to the nonprofit and instead be sold for um, fair market value. So what they do is they come in and they claim that the GP sale of the nonprofit is a breach of fiduciary duties, um, therefore justifying their removal of the GP for cause. So all of that is exactly what happened here and RGP was not having it and they brought suit um, to claim that they were not validly removed. So as a reminder, as Brian mentioned earlier, when we're talking about an alternative entity, they do have traditional corporate fiduciary duties. However, those duties in the underlying partnership or LLC agreement can be modified or even eliminated. So the first step in all these cases is the court goes and looks at that governing document which is what, what Vice Chancellor Zern did here. Um, she starts off by looking at the partnership agreement. So here she looks specifically at the limited purpose provision of the partnership and found that because the purpose was so limited, the general partner here did not have authority or a fiduciary duty to act outside of that limited purpose. As she says, a partnership is fundamentally a creature of agency. The limited partners appoint the GP as their agent only for the purpose they set for the partnership. Here the purpose um, in the partnership agreement was limited so that the fund was set up to syndicate the exchange of capital for tax credits. It was not set up to profit off of the property. Um, later in the agreement, the court also finds that there's been a further modification and replacement of the GP's fiduciary duties. Its duties here were really limited to the safekeeping of the assets of the fund, which were the tax credits, not the property. Finding no general duty of loyalty or care owed by the GP, the court finds that there was no breach of fiduciary duty and therefore no cause for its removal. So our takeaway here is to not ignore that purpose provision um, that's oftentimes right at the beginning of your partnership or LLC agreement. It's important because it not just sets what authority your entity has to take action, um, it also can be used um, to limit fiduciary duties. So with that, we'll turn it back to Brian for a discussion on earnouts. Yeah, thank you. 
So we saw a really interesting urnout case that dealt with the court's interpretation of the effort standard agreed to by buyer to achieve the urnout, and that is the Men versus ConMed Corp case. The background on this case is that ConMed acquired a medical device company, which was developing a clip applier product to be used in laparoscopic surgeries. Now this device was still under development, so ConMed agreed to pay $1.25 million up front, plus up to $10.25 million based on development milestones, plus an earnout of $2 million in the first commercial sale, 10% of net sales thereafter. Before closing, ConMed found safety issues with the device and negotiated for the right to change the design to address those issues. Aside from that, ComEd agreed to use commercially best efforts, that was the standard here, to maximize the milestone payments and the earnout. Further, if it breached that covenant, the parties agreed that the payments would accelerate, provided that buyer, ConMed, was allowed to terminate the development and sale of the device if it posed a risk of injury to patients. After closing, ConMed spent years and real money trying to develop the device, but the safety concerns were made, and ultimately it terminated development. The sellers naturally brought suit, alleging that ConMed failed to meet the commercially best effort standard to develop the device, and alleging it discontinued the development for reasons other than risk of injury to patients. Now, the most interesting part of this case for M&A practitioners is how the court interpreted the effort standard that the parties agreed to. The court said in part, quote, although deal practitioners have some sense of the hierarchy among efforts clauses, courts applying the standards have struggled to discern daylight between them. This court, for example, has interpreted best efforts obligations as on par with commercially reasonable efforts. This decision therefore interprets commercially best efforts as imparting the same meaning as best efforts. So what does that mean for how it was applied? Well, Vice Chancellor McCormick found that in evaluating effort standards, oops, courts look at whether the party found reasonable grounds to take the action it did and whether the party sought to address the problems with its counterparty. That applies whether it's best efforts, commercial reasonable efforts, reasonable best efforts, all of the effort standards that they look at. And here the facts pour out that ConMed spent substantial time and money on development efforts and even paid $9 million in development milestones as a result. ConMed also assigned a full team of development experts to the task and they continued development efforts for years before finally determining that it just had no other option but to terminate the development of the device due to the safety concerns. As a result, following a seven-day trial, she found that there was no breach of the efforts covenant by ConMed. All right, to round out our presentation today, I'd like to send it back over to John to preview what is shaping up to be a bigger blockbuster than Top Gun Maverick. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Well, without a doubt, the most widely covered development in the world of mergers and acquisitions since our last M&A update is the saga involving Elon Musk and Twitter. Uh, as a result of Elon deciding that he simply must own his favorite toy and then deciding that he no longer wants it after all, he will renew his on-again, off-again relationship with Delaware's Court of Chancery. Over the past five years, Elon has a mixed record of success in Chancery, taking an L on a motion to dismiss a stockholder lawsuit brought in reaction to a $55 billion package of equity incentives awarded by Tesla, Tesla to Elon, taking another couple of L's and one mixed decision on various proceedings brought in connection with the acquisition by one Elon affiliated company, Tesla, of another Elon affiliated company, SolarCity. Elon Musk has long been a notoriously prolific user of Twitter. Uh, sometimes this has worked to his detriment, like the time he announced to buy a Twitter that he had funding secured for a transaction to take Tesla private. As it turns out, the funding wasn't secured. Tesla remains a public company and Elon dug into his sock drawer to pay $20 million in civil fines to the SEC. In early April, after a couple bumps in the road, including initially filing on the wrong form and then filing the right form 11 days late, Elon filed a Schedule 13D disclosing that he had acquired a 9.6% stake in Twitter, making him Twitter's largest shareholder. Following the 13D filing, Twitter and Elon engaged in a courtship that resulted in Twitter announcing that Elon had agreed to join Twitter's board and to cap his ownership at 14.9%.
Less than a week later, Twitter's CEO announced that Elon had changed his mind and wouldn't be joining the board after all. In mid-April, Elon announced that he was making an offer to buy Twitter at a price of $54.20 per share. As the slide notes, this price reflects a 38% premium to Twitter's stock price on April 1st, the last day, the last trading day before Elon's toehold investment was announced. Not noted on the slide, but widely observed in pop culture was the significance of this price in relation to one of Elon's favorite internet memes, which involve references to him smoking blunts, Joe Rogan, and 420, which is the holiest of numbers in all of cannabis culture. Twitter responded by adopting a poison pill, which itself contains a sly 420 reference, which is a telltale that it was put on the shelf in anticipation of Elon's move. And perhaps the most surprising development in this saga, Elon negotiated and assembled a credible financing package basically over the course of an April weekend. This brought Twitter to the table, and on April 25th, the parties announced that they had reached a deal for Elon to acquire Twitter. By mid-May, Elon was experiencing buyer's remorse, and on May 14th, he tweeted that the deal was on hold pending his investigation of the prevalence of spam or bot accounts on the platform. Two days later, Twitter's CEO posted a detailed tweet thread describing Twitter's process for estimating bot accounts, to which Elon's only response was a poop emoji. That same day, at a conference, Elon started to lay the groundwork for a price drop. Elon spent the month of June absorbing what has been described as a fire hose of information provided by Twitter about the manner in which bot accounts are measured and asserting in various communications his view of his rights to not consummate the transaction and terminate the merger agreement. On July 8th, in an actual letter to Twitter, Elon's lawyers formally asserted his right to terminate the merger agreement and abandon the transaction. Five days later, Twitter sued in Delaware Chancery Court, seeking specific performance of Elon's obligations to close the merger pursuant to the terms of the merger agreement. The case will be heard during a five-day trial to be held in October. In the early days of his pursuit of Twitter, Elon made kind of a big deal about how he had instructed his lawyers to agree to a merger agreement on seller-friendly terms. This was a means of demonstrating his seriousness about the transaction. Those instructions were followed and the definitive merger agreement contains no financing or diligence contingencies, a narrowly defined definition of material adverse effect and seller favorable standards for the bring down of reps and warranties. The merger agreement provides for a $1 billion reverse termination fee, which is payable in the event Twitter elects to terminate the transaction as a result of the contemplated financing becoming unavailable, contemplated debt financing becoming unavailable, and grants to the parties broad rights to specific performance to enforce the terms of the contract. The case will be heard by Vice Chancellor McCormick. The vice chancellor presided in the Snow Phipps cake cake case from 2001. This is the cake decorator case that Amelia referred to earlier. Amelia has talked in detail about this deal in her previous roundup of pandemic related deal litigation. In the Snow Phipps case, after a trial in which the buyer asserted that a Mac had occurred and that the seller had breached various interim covenants, the buyer was ordered to specifically perform its obligations, including its obligations to secure the necessary debt financing and to close the transaction. Many observers of the Chancery Court expect that the Snow Phipps case will play a prominent role in the Twitter case, with Twitter arguing that this deal requires nothing more than a straightforward application of the holdings from the Snow Phipps case, and Elon seeking to distinguish his case from the buyer's case in Snow Phipps. To me, one of the most interesting issues at play in this case is the dilemma it presents to the institution of the Delaware Chancery Court itself. 
Calling back to Vice Chancellor Slight's language in the sandbagging case we discovered, we discussed earlier in the program, Delaware's whole brand is that its courts, Chancery in particular, are stable, predictable enforcers of arm length contracts negotiated by sophisticated parties. So one can easily imagine a vice chancellor seeing this as a prime opportunity to spank someone who the court views as having behaved badly and to send a stern message to others who might think of doing the same in the future. However, given his history, the possibility that Elon would simply ignore an order of specific performance can't be discounted. So if letting Elon off the hook or partially off the hook would be bad for Delaware's brand, how disastrous would, have him, would be having him simply disregard an order of, De, of a Delaware court? Whatever happens, it'll be loud and messy and, and fascinating, and we look forward to talking about it again in January. Brian, I'll turn it back over to you for a couple final words. Yo, that's all for today, folks. We're out of time. We thank everyone for coming. Thanks to Amelia and John for presenting. As John said, we will see you at the next Seminary Update in January.